Boa tarde a todos, gostaria de saudar toda a comunidade da, da pós-graduação da Universidade de São Paulo, nossos alunos, servidores, professores, em mais um seminário da Comissão Didática Pedagógica é, da Pró-Reitoria de Pós-Graduação, é, que tem como objetivo é, várias ações, e esses seminários né, programados por essa comissão, o que nós estamos querendo é discutir princípios é, discutindo as mudanças que a, a Covid está causando na educação, os pontos positivos que nós podemos incorporar é, no nosso futuro, no, no nosso ensino da, da universidade, é, além então, de nós termos plataformas, de nós termos as ferramentas, é importante que nós discutamos os princípios desse ensino, os fatores positivos, fatores negativos, sempre buscando a qualidade é na formação é, dos nossos alunos. Então, eu parabenizo novamente, já fiz várias vezes em público, o trabalho da comissão, e aqui nós temos o Manuel, o Cardo, o Luiz Felipe e o Valdes, mas tem vários colegas que estão trabalhando bastante, o Manuel e o Carlos, eles estão responsáveis por esses seminários, e hoje nós teremos um modelo é, um pouco diferente do que nós estávamos habituados a fazer. Então, nós temos... É, dois professores, o professor Chigueiro, que já participou de um, um evento conosco anteriormente, e o Peter Kaufman, do, os dois relacionados ao MIT, eles vão fazer palavras, é, palestras gravadas, tá? então vocês vão assi assistir a gravações que eles já fizeram, o que o Hugo é, formatou, agradeço também o trabalho do Hugo, e ao final dessas palestras, o Peter vai entrar ao vivo para nós podermos fazer o debate com ele das perguntas que vocês colocarem no chat é, do YouTube. Então, eu é, espero que nós tenhamos uma boa tarde e, na verdade, nós estamos nos preparando para esse final de 20 e início de 21 com maior qualidade é, do nosso ensino. Acho que uma particularidade de, dessa pandemia que nós devemos aproveitar aproveitar são essas oportunidades, né? então nós temos as gravações, as palestras de pessoas no exterior, seria muito difícil se nós não tivéssemos esse tipo de tecnologia, esse tipo de, de metodologia. Então, é, parabéns novamente, eu passo a palavra para o Manuel e depois, posteriormente, ao Carlos, para eles fazerem a apresentação é, do seminário. Então, Manuel, por favor. Obrigado, professor Calotti, obrigado a todos, boa tarde a todos que estão conosco novamente. E muito rapidamente, é só, antes de passar a palavra ao Carlos, só lembrá-los né, do evento de segunda-feira, o segundo encontro, que é também né, um seminário, né, que é formatado um pouco como um workshop, sobre o papel, né, linguagens hipermediáticas e processos formativos, né? o papel de novos meios e linguagens nesses processos, com as professoras Adriana Bruno, Ana Maria Hessel e Lucila Pet. Né? Alguns de vocês já assistiram o primeiro, né? e agora teremos né, a conclusão segunda na, na, na segunda-feira. Né? Eu, inclusive, coloquei no YouTube as mesmas, essa mesma informação e também né, o link para aqueles que desejarem assistir a esse encontro na segunda-feira. Um bom seminário. Carlos, por favor. Muito obrigado, Manuel. Então, um prazer estar aqui de novo na série de seminários Vivenciando eh, 2020. Eh, muito obrigado a todos e a todas por estar eh, na audiência. Eu vou apresentar, então, o professor Shigeru Miyagawa. Ele é professor e pesquisador na área de linguística e especialista na educação remota. Ele é autor de vários livros e é diretor do programa Open Learning de MIT e co-diretor também do programa Visualizando Culturas. E ele atua também como diretor do programa de educação online da Universidade de Tóquio. E Peter Kaufman é cineasta, escritor, professor. Ele trabalha também no escritório de aprendizado digital de MIT, na mesma é, oficina de Open Learning. Ele é fundador da iniciativa Intelligent Television e tem sido consultor em inúmeros contextos relacionados à aprendizagem digital e é, Open Learning, inclusive no nível governamental. 
né? E o seu livro, The New Enlightenment and uh, the Fight to Free Knowledge, está próximo a sair pela Seven Stories eh, Press. E esta eh, atividade de hoje, que vai ter o, o formato de perguntas e, e respostas, que foi gravado eh, previamente, e, um, foi é, sublegendado para facilitar, então, é, a, a, o entendimento. Espero que é, funcione é, tudo bem. Agradeço muito o trabalho do, do Hugo, verdadeiramente, com a edição, né? mas é, frente a alguns problemas técnicos que a gente teve na ocasião. E, é, como já falado pelo professor Carlotti, teremos é, a presença de Peter Kaufman depois é, da apresentação gravada para é, responder algumas perguntas é, ao vivo e ter é, um pouco de debate. Então, sem mais preâmbulos, eu agradeço de novo. E, uh, é, Hugo, por favor, podemos começar então com o streaming da entrevista. Obrigado. Hello, everybody. Uh, again, thank Professor uh, Shigeru Miyagawa and Professor Peter Kaufman for accepting our invitation and are being with us uh, today. We, in fact, we have two related topics to be discussed in this cycle of seminar, the 2020 cycle, both related to the production of knowledge in higher education from some perspectives. For instance, availability, accessibility, and governance. In our previous seminar last week, Professor Nilson Machado addressed the issue of the production of knowledge as a common based on Eleanor Ostrom theory, Eleanor Ostrom theoretical framework, uh, a framework that by which she was awarded the Nobel Prize of Economy. In fact, Professor Machado posed the question, uh, we shall look at knowledge as a public common or as a commodity. We will continue today with the, the concept of knowledge under the view of a new enlightenment, as in uh, the recent uh, Professor Kaufman, Professor Peter Kaufman's book. Uh, so, there, therefore, uh, these two seminars are highly related and uh, most likely we, will, we may revisit some of the ideas and concepts from our past event. Our first question then is to start. Let's first discuss some words that are becoming increasingly frequently in the academic world, open and free. How shall, shall we read those words? Free, for example, can mean no cost associated, or, as in the book, free as in freedom. Uh, I'm referring to uh, Professor Kaufman's book. Uh, that uh, free as in freedom, in other words, that resources shall be available for free intellectual actions. Similarly, open may mean free to access, but also not covered, not fastened, among others. A first question then is, what open shall mean when we say open learning? What free shall be in the, shall be in the context of free knowledge? Uh, I believe Professor Miyagawa will start, no? Thank you so much. It's so nice to be back with you uh, and uh, uh, be able to have this conversation. So these are very important issues that all of us must think about. And so I'm going to pick up on uh, uh, the notion of free. Uh, it's something that uh, I have thought about quite a bit over the last 20 years, ever since we started Open Courseware at MIT. So. Uh, some 20 years ago, uh, we said that we we're going to make uh, the course material from all of the courses we teach at MIT open and free. 
and we use the term free uh, to mean that there is no cost to the user. Uh, and today, when we say free in the MIT context of open learning, we mean no cost to the user. Uh, so, uh, so that's how we define it. Uh, of course, uh, for us, it may be free, but for the user, there is cost in access. And we are finding out that, in fact, uh, uh, for the user uh, to have something free does not always mean that they can access it freely uh, if they don't have the, uh, the requisite um, uh, uh, requirements for accessing. Um, Peter can talk about that when he talks about open. Uh, just a note about uh, this very interesting notion of free as in freedom. I think that's becoming a very, very important issue that we have to uh, debate and negotiate. Uh, so when we say free, yes, we mean freedom in the sense of uh, being able to express what we want. Uh, but, uh, you know, the notion of censorship creeps in. And the most uh, effective censorship is self-censorship. And uh, as we see things happening on the web uh, and think people being attacked, for example, for, th for their views, uh, what we have to really guard against is self-censorship and make sure that we are able to tell the truth uh, when we when we freely provide uh, knowledge uh, to the world. Okay, thank you. Peter? Um, thank you very much for um, inviting me to be part of this. And thank you, Shigeru, for the connection um, here. Uh, about open and free, we know what the opposites of these words mean. So the opposite of open is closed. And that means closed to someone or closed to everyone. Um, and the opposite of free can be something with a cost, but it can also mean something in a prison, something that is um, unfree. And um, you know, in in this in this work that I've just finished, I've tried to describe. Um, free a little bit in that second capacity, uh, riffing a little bit off um, Rousseau and, uh, you know, his opening statement um, in the social contract that man is born free and yet everywhere he is in chains. Could it be the case that knowledge is actually born free and yet everywhere it is in chains? And um, riffing further on that, I think it's interesting to look at the structure of copyright the way it's been set up in the modern era since the 18th century uh, and on, uh, automatically after everything else happens to a piece of intellectual property, as it's called, it falls into the public domain. And maybe that's its state of nature, therefore. Maybe that's after the licenses expire, after the contracts are done. Uh, you know, the work that we all do uh, is intended to be part of a sort of general uh, knowledge commons. And, and I think that helps us think about free. Um, open to me is accessible. Um, accessible to as many people as possible. Um, but free, free goes further. Our second We're, question, here it goes. The word knowledge is a broad one. We can think about scientific knowledge, the power of megadata, inventions, and so much more. In times of a liquid modernity, as posed by Zygmunt Bauman, how should we tackle free knowledge in a burnout society, as posed also by Byung Shu Han? When we think about free knowledge, what knowledge? It's a concept that we can split, fragment, or even organize, aiming at the development of a taxonomy of priorities. If so, 
who would choose and what would be the consequences of such a, cho a choice? Okay, this is a uh, wonderful question. Uh, and uh, there are many, many things that uh, uh, are in your question that uh, we need to think about. So the nature of knowledge. Well, the nature of knowledge is being challenged uh, today. Uh, so what we thought is a given based on scientific knowledge, you know, climate change, wearing a mask uh, is now uh, uh, just commonly questioned. And so all of a sudden, uh, what we thought was knowledge that is a, uh, uh, a common among society has become a commodity uh, that can be negotiated. You either take it or leave it. Okay? And so uh, this is uh, uh, something that, uh, uh, and as things become faster and faster in this liquid modernity, as Bowman says, where things break down and before you can fix things, then you have to bring in new things. Uh, we really do need to negotiate this in a way that we haven't done before. Uh, and I don't think anyone knows how we do that. Uh, there are some things that I think about with, with knowledge, uh, being at MIT. Uh, and seeing the kinds, particularly of technological uh, advancements that, that we're seeing. So uh, the Morse law, uh, which uh, um, double the, the speed of uh, um, uh, bits, uh, doubled every two years from the 1960s until just recently, uh, you know, it, uh, is now giving us just unimaginable power. Uh, and it's powering uh, AI, right? And but you know, where are we with all that? Uh, AI will start to produce knowledge. It's already starting to uh, produce knowledge, and it is starting to uh, impinge on uh, our freedom. For example, with facial recognition uh, and with private information. Okay, uh, that is all being made possible by the, uh, the Morse law and, and technology. We really, as a society, need to negotiate, you know, what we have built. You know, have we built something that is uh, beneficial uh, to us, that can produce beneficial knowledge, or did we produce something that is uh, not so beneficial to us? That's one uh, kind of question I have. The other question uh, I have is that, uh, 150 years ago, uh, the Western world decided to split knowledge into technology and humanity. Okay? They were not split before that, but uh, for a number of historical reasons, starting in with uh, universities in Germany, Humboldt University, the two got split. And that split was adopted globally and today we still have the split. Okay. So you have humanities on this side of campus and science and technology on that side. Okay. We're coming to a point in time in history where this split is now really hurting us. It's really hurting us. And that knowledge uh, cannot be compartmentalized in the way that it was visualized 150 years ago with technology and science over here and humanities over here. Uh, the kinds of uh, technologies that we see today with AI and so forth, okay, they are not just technology, but they require uh, human judgment, okay, uh, which will come from humanity. And unless the two are mel uh, you know, melded together into a coherent knowledge body, the society is going to always struggle with piecemeal knowledge that can very well hurt us inadvertently, but could very well hurt us uh, if we don't begin to, in a sense, uh, correct the mistake that we made 150 years ago when we split, split knowledge into these two spheres. So this is what I think about with knowledge. Peter, would you like to comment on this? Sure. Um... So <clears throat> we're conducting this conversation at a moment um, that very few of us in the United States could have ever um, 
thought possible in our worst nightmares. Um, and there's an attack essentially uh, being mounted by the most powerful people and institutions, people in those institutions in our country. Um, you guys have some experience with this too. Um, in in uh, <clears throat> on every topic, from science um, to um, well, particularly science and medicine right now and health. Um, I think the, one good way to um, approach knowledge is to think of knowledge as that which is verifiable, and that was an approach that. Um, a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers uh, um, uh, inaugurated when they created this massive encyclopedia uh, in the late 1700s um, under the leadership of Denis Diderot <clears throat> and some others, Rousseau contributed. Um, the whole setup was one so that cross-referencing could be possible between all of these articles. And as Shigeru was saying, these articles were in sciences and in how to, you know, carve a salad bowl out of wood, in um, humanities, concepts of law and civil rights, um, to, you know, history and geography. <clears throat> but the whole point was to make sure that the knowledge that was published was somehow verifiable. And that's part of what Wikipedia is about today. Um, it's at the core of the Wikipedia project, and it's at the core of a lot of other projects that exist to uh, bring knowledge into the commons and make sure that it's not um, fake. Let's put it that way. This is a moment of fake news where people talk about alternative realities and alternative facts. And they're not really, there shouldn't be like altern. There's like reality, I think. And there's, and there's facts. Um, and so knowledge is that which is verifiable and can be verified by us. And when I say us, I'll just end with this. I think um, we need to privilege, if it's not elitist, uh, I hope it's not, knowledge institutions in that, in that role. And I think that that is the place that um, universities, and maybe we'll get to this later, um, uh, museums, um, archives, critically important, and um, uh, public media, uh, such as it is here, um, and others that are sort of non-commercial, non-state, really, actors, um, need to, um, need to play. They all need to be in this verifiability business, and the practical, um, methods of that, I think, is, is something we could open up, uh, for discussion. Thank you for your answer. Uh, also, Shigeru, let's move to uh, another related uh, topic. Mm, in uh, knowledge-related forums, uh, these words uh, we have discussed already, free and open, they are often almost always related to an, an online world. And uh, this is a a world uh, of 100% uh, transparency. Would you agree with uh, this statement? That would be uh, what, like part A of the question. And the other would be that that uh, only a fraction of this world really has uh, online access. And uh, the among those uh, with access, uh, the quality of access uh, is also variable, perhaps a continuum. So uh, free and open perhaps apply only to a privileged part of uh, the population. Uh, uh, what will be your views uh, about this? Uh, so uh, there are two parts to this. Uh, I'll, I'll comment just briefly on the first. Uh, I do want to 
spend a little bit of time on the second. So uh, free and open, does that mean 100% transparent, uh, transparency? Absolutely not. You look at Facebook, uh, and uh, we now know that uh, the free and open information being uh, provided on Facebook is often, uh, and without us realizing, uh, is not at all transparent, but they come with a very clear agenda, a political agenda, uh, a social agenda uh, that is uh, not at all innocent. And so just because something is free and open does not mean that uh, the intent, the agency uh, behind it is 100% uh, transparent. In fact, it is uh, opaque and it could get, it could be very dangerous uh, if we think that it is 100% transparent. Uh, Facebook is now under uh, very uh, close uh, scrutiny uh, exactly on this point. Uh, and as we head into the presidential elections uh, in November, uh, it's going to get closer and closer uh, scrutiny. Uh, but uh, uh, free and open does not mean transparent at all. And we, we all need to remember that. Uh, in terms of free and open uh, and access, uh, this is something that is uh, uh, it's, it's really, really an important point. And it has to do, again, with uh, the political uh, landscape. So we have a very polarized society in, in the United States. And when you look at it, it really is a, a divide between those who are uh, educated uh, for many years, like us, and those who are not. Uh, let's say between uh, uh, college educated versus those without a college education. If you look at the polls and who uh, supports uh, one candidate uh, and who supports the other candidate, uh, one clear uh, dividing line is education. So those who have uh, less than the college education, uh, I think the majority support one candidate. Okay. And so uh, the polarization that has happened, uh, many, many reasons, but uh, education is one reason for it. We didn't realize it. We didn't realize it until 2016. What a terrible, terrible thing that we, we did without knowing by uh, not being more aware that uh, access to education uh, is uh, is uh, dividing the country, and my my fear, and it's very funny for me to say, as someone who really believes in open education, my fear is that uh, if we don't do something uh, consciously, this idea of open education can aggravate the divide. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, the kind of material that we provide open and free, that's well known, MIT Open Courseware, the MOOCs on edX and Coursera, we know that they are being used predominantly by uh, college students and college educated students, something like 64, 65%. Okay? And so uh, the well-educated are getting more well-educated, while those who really do need this education are not being able to access it for a variety of reasons. And so open uh, access uh, teaching material, unless we really think very hard, can aggravate the polarization that uh, happened because of unequal access to education earlier uh, in history in this society. Peter, would you like to compliment on something? Um, yes, that, I mean, that was fascinating. Um, I'll take the second question first. Um, I think there are privileged populations um, everywhere in the world. Um, it's a privilege to have clean water. It's a privilege to have uh, the right of free speech. It's a privilege to have the right to assemble. It's a privilege to have clean air. Um, and so, you know, um, <clears throat> internet access is also a privilege. Access to libraries, um, 
access to radio and television as Central and Eastern Europe proved for us during the Cold War. Um, yeah, these are important things. Um, and just because some part of the globe does not have access to these elements of modern society and human um, existence today, I don't know that we should view the work that we do to extend um, uh, the reach of those uh, privileges as somehow um, faulty uh, by the very act that we're so lucky, by the very fact that we're so lucky to have them <clears throat> every day. So I think we need to work in what we do to make um, the privileged segment of the population, as you call it, uh, every segment of the population for all those things and for um, for access to knowledge uh, as well. So um, on the on the free versus open and uh, the issue of transparency, yeah, I think there's not a lot of transparency, weirdly. Um, and that's part of where verifiability comes in. When you make a statement, um, we should be able to know if that statement is true by being able to cross-reference it. Um, that's the principle of scholarly communication today. Uh, lawyers are big into that also. Um, and I think that, you know, some someday when a politician gives a speech and we watch it on the internet, we should be able to see scrolling alongside the text of that speech or the words that we're hearing, all of the different vested interests that, that politician might have uh, to an oil lobby or to a chemical company or to a, a union here and there who contributed or helped to install them or helped one way or another to put them where they are. So. I think um, we have to work in everything that we do to increase transparency and increase um, access, transparency of knowledge and access to it. Thank you, Peter and uh, Shigeru. So, um, how shall we address then this uh, issue of uh, inequality? How, what shall we do? Uh, I'm aiming at um, its uh, elimination. What we're learning quite sadly is that uh, teaching online amplifies and aggravates inequalities that exist in society. Let me give you one example. When the New York public school system went online in March because of the pandemic, they found out some things. Uh, they found out that many kids didn't have a computer at home. Many kids didn't have a Wi-Fi at home. Many kids did not have a home. Uh, and when you look at the statistics, it turns out that, so New York public school system is the largest public school system in the country. There are 1.1 uh, million students in that system. And 100,000 or almost 10% of the students in the New York public school system uh, commute from homeless shelters, 10%. Uh, and what we, are learning about these kids is that you know they're not in. Uh, so when the New York uh, public school system realized this, they quickly uh, lent out uh, uh, iPads and uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, which is good. Uh, but also, it turns out that these kids were depending on the school system for food. They go to school to get uh, breakfast and lunch. And so now, not only did the school system uh, have to uh, provide for Wi-Fi and computer. They had to provide for food. You know, very basic, very basic uh, survival uh, 
uh, items that uh, that uh, they they had to do. and we you know it's because we went online that we are learning about this uh uh oecd did a survey with harvard on i think about uh, 80 or 90 countries and their readiness for online education uh and it turns out that uh, uh most countries are not fully ready for online education. So they ask three questions. Uh, is there a computer at home? Okay, that's an obvious question. Is there a Wi-Fi at home? That's also an obvious question. But the third question, do you have a quiet place to study at home? That one, many countries failed uh, because of the, the home situation. And so inequality uh, gets amplified, aggravated, by uh, online education. And so here again, uh, to provide online education is wonderful and it's good, but uh, we have to realize that we are uh, unintentionally um, ag aggravating, amplifying uh, you know, bad elements, uh, inequalities in society. And if we are to start dealing with uh, social issues, problems, polarizations in societies, uh, you know, just basic truth, the, uh, the, our ability to, uh, to judge what is true and what is not, that's all based on education. Uh, we really, you know, as MIT, as uh, USP, uh, as all of these privileged institutions, we are in the center of society to think about these problems. And we have to uh, really get our students, our faculty, to begin to think about these issues. Because after all, we are here to serve society. And uh, uh, particularly as we go online, I think these issues uh, are going to be fundamental to uh, how we think about teaching and how we think about research. Thank you, Shigeru. Peter, would you like to comment on this? Um, yes, please. I mean, that was a beautiful statement, and I just wish to echo it. I've had the chance over the past 10 or 15 years to speak a lot with Shigeru about his understanding and his approach to online learning. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah um, uh, it's always, a, you know, an incredible treat and delight for me to hear his latest thinking. And this, you know, I'm from New York. Um, this is a city that uh, I grew up in, and this is a city that in many ways is one of the great cities of the world, and it's a travesty. I think uh, in answer to your specific question, we have to be as online educators and as those who produce online courses and those who help distribute and market them, um, we have to be both uh, humble and ambitious. Uh, we have to be humble, again to echo what Shigeru said, to know that online education is not a cure-all for the world's problems. In our, in this group that we um, started last year called the Open 2020 Working Group, we uh, begin every meeting pretty much by looking at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, there's 17 of them, which is a weird number. But there's 17 of them, and they include things like no poverty, zero hunger, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, some of the things that we're talking about today. And I think that you can't, when Shigeru speaks, again, not to just consistently echo the statement that went before mine, but um, when Shigeru speaks of our roles here, we have to advocate for everything at once, recognizing that we can't, yeah, create that much better world unless we do. And that's the ambition part of it all, you know? What is it that we're presenting to people online? How are we teaching? What technologies are we using? Um, these are things that we need to think through, you know, uh, soup to nuts, as we say, A to Z. Um, and, uh, um, we have to do it um, in everything that we do. Thank you, both of you, for uh, your answers.
And uh, I want to move now on to uh, a topic that we just uh, touched in, in passing, but that uh, I would like to develop a, a bit more. And uh, is that, uh, I mean, of course, there is no one single model of university. There are many models. But uh, independently of that, uh, we understand that universities as uh, institutions, they play a natural role when discussing open learning and free knowledge. But uh, having in mind that free knowledge is uh, not only a governance issue, but it's also related to social inclusion, as we just uh, discussed, and social empowerment. What would be the role of universities in, in this context? And um, considering that universities alone would not be able to achieve uh, the major goals we are discussing. Peter, would you like to take that first? We switch roles. Um, sure. Uh, universities have incredible power. Um, um, and I, th I think that um, that power is completely underutilized. Um, one of the things that you see today, part of my role at MIT is to help raise support um, funding for work that we do. And you'll see that the heads of some of the foundations that we work with are uh, on the front lines of conversations today around race equality, um, economic equality, uh, gender equality, uh, and all of the challenges that our current leadership and other things now present um, to the progress that we thought we'd made. I think universities have extraordinary power. Um, and um, uh, they have the power uh, where, where they're situated in American society, certainly. Some of these elite private universities like MIT and Harvard and some of these uh, historically black colleges and universities, community colleges, state universities, which are incredibly powerful, just as entities, as employers, as economic and social uh, institutions, but also the amount of um, reach that we have. Uh, uh, you know, we're not exactly celebrities. We're not uh, great rappers or basketball players or whatever. But uh, the people who work at universities, the people who lead these universities, uh, have the ability to reach millions through the voices uh, they represent. And we also have these cameras in our hands now. And I think increasingly, uh, you know, we're relying on, uh, here anyway, video uh, for all kinds of, um, for all kinds of news, uh, the evening news here has become essentially on television and on the web, a series of clips about what happened earlier in the day. Can you believe this? Uh, let's watch it again. Um, we have the ability to produce an incredible amount of quality uh, <clears throat> content, not just the 2,500 courses that MIT puts online as part of OpenCourseWare, um, uh, 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 but uh, but so much more, and I, and I think um, at universities, together with other knowledge institutions, now need to band together in ways that we sort of thought about doing in the 1960s to create a kind of new network, um, uh, not unlike public broadcasting, um, which, by the way, the first sort of uh, the leading spirit of that whole conversation was a former president uh, of MIT. Thank you, Peter. Shigeru, would you like to comment on this? Yes. Uh, so um, uh, right now, this semester, I'm sitting in on a, uh, a course in the Department of Economics. It is one of the top department of economics uh, in the world. We have many Nobel laureates. And the course I'm sitting in on, which is taught by some of the, uh, the elite 
economist in the department is the economics of racism. Okay? And it's very instructive uh, seeing that course uh, on what we should be doing uh, as educators. Uh, what this course does is to take uh, ourselves out of just a setting for universities and we put ourselves in the real world. And so uh, there are people who come in who work with uh, uh, healthcare systems um, and often they are themselves doctors. Okay? We have people who come in who work with a prison system uh, because there's a lot of racism in prisons uh, and, and that's brought in. And students in turn are encouraged to do field work with uh, these you know, various uh, domains of society. 150 years ago, I mentioned how uh, science, technology, and humanities, humanities got split up. The other thing that was started with Humboldt University is that university was viewed as a place to do research as well as teaching, and that's important. But uh, there are cases where the research has become so uh, distinct from society, so uh, disconnected from society that sometimes you wonder, how is this going to connect to uh, society? I think that one of the things that we must do as universities is to demonstrate to the society and to ourselves the importance and the value that we bring uh, as uh, academics to the society by becoming much more embedded in the society than we have been. Uh, and uh, I think that's true with, with every field, uh, science, technology, and humanities. Can, can I add something or does that disrupt our whole? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, every day, um, what did we have? The president, uh, Trump, um, spoke uh, favorably of how a journalist was shot, an American journalist was shot. Another uh, remark that he made also this week was, was um, you know, how, how pleasant it was to watch a journalist get manhandled by a crowd um, and roughed up. Uh, you know, there's this statement, um, you know, first they came, first they came for the Jews. I, I can't remember how it all goes. As a Jew, I should know it. Uh, but then there was nobody left in the end. And I think the entire journalistic community got up in arms about uh, this attack on journalism. But where were the university presidents uh, speaking out about this? Where were the heads of every other thing that matters, uh, but especially the university presidents. Because you know what, if, if we're celebrating in the most powerful office in the world, an attack on freedom of speech and those people who deliver um, news and information to us, uh, attacks on knowledge as it's produced and disseminated by the university, are not that far behind. So I just think we need to, um, yeah, wear a little bit more armor and, uh, you know, get out in front of some of these things with, um, yeah, more um, spirit perhaps and bravery than we've done to date before, uh, before it's too late. Uh, let's then move for, uh, and Let's see how we do it. But uh, during this topic, considering some of the, uh, the major goals of universities is related uh, not only to the production but also the creation of knowledge as much as possible, open and free, as you have been pointing out, either globally or locally. What would be other major actors in this discussion? You know? And how universities should relate you know, uh, to these actors? Somehow, uh, people already highlight some of these approaches. What shall we say about this problem more 
either globally and locally. As I mentioned, uh, I, I think the role of the university should be much more embedded in the real society than it has been. Uh, and it's true not only with faculty, but also with students. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, one thing that online education allows us to do, and I, I hope that people take advantage of it, is that it frees up uh, education from the physical uh, limitations that right now we have, where we have to show up in a in a classroom and teach, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from nine to ten. Uh, but instead, if uh, if we make uh, courses online possible, at least for part of the semester, then students can be free to go and work in uh, places all over the world. Uh, there are students who would love to work, for example, in Africa, dealing with issues of water. Uh, and uh, you know HIV and so forth. It's very difficult to do right now, uh, given the limitations, uh, the physical limitations. So virtual uh, worlds do free up uh, students and faculty from doing that, and we should take advantage of that and really kind of bust out of this physical uh, uh, re restriction that uh, uh, has been imposed on us. Uh, Peter, um, yeah, no, that's that's a beautiful vision, and I think that also uh, there are other uh, sort of custodians of verifiable knowledge out there, um, people who are essentially our brothers and sisters in the in the uh, library world, in the museum world, in the uh, archive world, uh, in public media. That is to say, non-commercial media. And I think we need to um, we need to do much more to unite. Well, thank you for those uh, uh, considerations. Uh, let's get into one uh, last uh, topic, and this is related to this uh, book, uh, Consilience, uh, uh, a book by Edward Wilson, published in 1999. And uh, curiously, the New York Times reviewed this book and uh, entitled the note, The New Enlightenment, in a relationship with uh, uh, Peter's uh, book that we mentioned already. And um, Wilson defended, just as Shigeru discussed here, like a much closer association between social and natural uh, sciences. And having this in, in mind and going back to this concept of free knowledge, the question would be how these ideas, free knowledge and free integration would be related. Can we think of free knowledge as a, a path uh, towards knowledge uh, integration? Shigeru would like to start. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's very wonderful to hear uh, Wilson, uh, Edward Wilson. Uh, he was a uh, uh, he lived in the same town I, I live in uh, when he was working, and uh, he gave a public lecture uh, to the townspeople. Very, very um, wonderful guy. So uh, yes, as I mentioned, uh, and I absolutely agree with uh, Wilson, uh, uh, we made a terrible mistake 150 years ago when we split uh, science and technology with humanities, and a lot of why we are in uh, trouble today has to do with uh, the mistake that we made 150 years ago. Uh, and uh, we have to correct that mistake by bringing the two back together, as Wilson says, and as Michael Datuzos, who was former head of MIT's computer science department said. Uh, but how do we do that? Well, that is really, really hard uh, because we are so used to uh, uh, divide, you know, it's like uh, the polarized society. We are so used to having uh, these two areas of uh, intellectual pursuit be split. Okay, uh, you know, if you try, for example, to do research that combines both science and humanities, it's almost impossible. It's almost impossible. You know, it's impossible to get funding. It, it's impossible to to get a job often because people don't know how to look at you, right? Uh, and so uh, the challenge is to begin to lower the wall that was built between science and technology on the one hand and humanities on the other so that we can begin to really tackle the you know every big problem we face today uh 
can only be answered by combining the two. Climate change, okay? That's not just a science and technology. It has to do with sociology, it has to do with law, it has to, uh, it all must come together to solve that, uh, the pandemic as well. And so absolutely, uh, and it's up to us at the university level to begin to lower that wall. Is there any comment on this topic? Uh, and I would echo also that passion. I think that um, uh, increasingly, the more things fall into uh, the commons, and uh, you know, uh, after rights to their use and expire contracts, uh, licenses, the more things become part of the public domain of knowledge. Um, I think they will find a way to integrate there. Uh, um, in the book that I've written, I speak about the physics of intellectual property and the fact that it's like gravity, all these great ideas and all of their instantiations eventually are supposed to wind up in the commons. But the original encyclopedia that the French put together had <clears throat> an article um, on uh, cannibalism and uh, at the very end of it, it had a cross-reference to Catholicism uh, because those guys were uh, anti-religious. Uh, and so they were talking about like, what is this body and blood of Christ, the way, what is this that, you know? And that was their sort of internal joke using this cross-referencing possibility to basically, um, you know, give a little elbow uh, to the church. I think when things wind up in Wikipedia, when things wind up in the internet archive, <clears throat> when things are free for us all to use, I hope anyway, that we'll reach a point where, as Shigeru has just said, uh, knowledge from law and knowledge from chemistry um, can be integrated more easily um, and used more easily by everyone. Well, uh, let's... Uh... Unfortunately, we are getting to the end of this wonderful conversation that, that we have been addressing so important issues as open learning, free knowledge, knowledge integration, and learning with Peter uh, Shigeru, uh, uh, in the context or aiming at a more equitable society, but aware that we are faced by a very significant neoconservative shift uh, uh, globally speaking. Uh, our uh, final request, let's say, is not, not exactly a question, but in this context, uh, and going to the, the focus of our uh, committee, you know, that's related to the formation of human resources, uh, considering that graduate school is somehow a nursery for knowledge, what message would you like to deliver to graduate students in this context? That's a very big, uh, very big task. Uh, I know that uh, a large audience for this are, are your graduate students at USP. Uh, you are embarking on a journey, a very important journey, an exciting journey, a journey that will have many, many uh, bumps along the way. But, uh, you know, pursue, pursue your interest, uh, your heart. Uh, and the only thing I ask of you is always keep in mind that the world is right now very broken, very broken. And it's going to take you to tackle these problems to start to fix, you know, what's broken about the world. And I'm counting on you. We are all counting on you to uh, to get the education that you need and 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 pursue your interests, uh, your heart, but also at the same time know that the world needs fixing, and you can do that. Peter, yeah, it's difficult to say something after that. I think um, to echo what Shigeru said about you know bringing breaking down these walls. It's a shame that the university, you know, has been described as an ivory tower. Uh, that's not really what it should be. 
Um, and in many ways, that's not what it is. Um, my hope is that graduate students, I was one of them once, um, will understand their connection to the real world every day. Um, and in the work that they do, uh, remain inspired by Shigeru's message of trying to fix that world. Um, but also to know that they are part of some kind of, to throw a little Lukacs into the conversation for you guys who keep on referring to Bauman and these other guys, uh, you know, world historical time. And I think they're part of a progress of knowledge that they have to struggle uh, to keep open in the same way that some of us take uh, cholesterol medication to keep our arteries from clogging. Um, we have to fight not only to learn more, but to enable other people to learn more from us. And that, I think, is the message I would impart. Okay. Uh, before uh, the closing arguments by Professor Carlos Navas, I just want to give here my gratitude and thank you guys very much for being with us today. Thank you very much. Shigeru, Peter, thank you. This has been wonderful. It's um, a shame we don't have uh, hours to keep discussing uh, these topics. Uh, thank you very much for being with us uh, today. Uh, okay. Uh, I will uh, talk in English very briefly. And uh, thank you. Uh, Peter, to be with us again, now live. We have a, a couple of questions, and I'll go straight to the first one. I mean, basically all the questions are related to the discussion about open and free knowledge, and but very much related to the how to bridge the gap between communicating with the society and how to try to avoid the increase of the inequality in online learning, as was pointed out by you and uh, Professor Shigeru. The first one, uh, the question was presented by Kahaled Shaban. Shaban. Uh, forgive me if I didn't pronounce the name correctly. Uh, Khaled, um, what's the function of knowledge and of uh, knowledge production? Uh, in terms of uh, the communication with the society and reducing the inequality and therefore talking about social development how should we communicate with the academy the academic society should we try to communicate with the academic society or with the society we live in how to balance it? how to balance internationaliz internationalization observing that uh, most of this production is uh, written and presented in English and there are many other uh, situations as you two guys analyzed in your uh, answers before you know? so how how to facilitate the access to this production and how to overcome the difficulty uh, related to online learning how do you see the, the these issues well <laughs> thanks for such an easy question you know there are like 20 questions in that question um first let me just say thank you for putting this on and for inviting me again and um i want to thank shigeru who couldn't join us today he's one of the um leaders and first movers in the open education uh, movement, one of the wisest people uh, I know. Um, and any time spent with him is good time indeed. So um, in answer to your question, your questions, uh, which you're masquerading as one question, um, I don't know. Um, but I can guess that um, there are efforts that um, from within the academy to go outside. There are efforts in book publishing, they're called crossover books. They're uh, books that are written by academics 
that are published by major trade publishers as opposed to by university presses and that reach the public at large in some way. They're not, uh, you know, for a particular discipline to mull over, you know, in a conference room to have closed debates. And those are important things. But I think <clears throat> it's a great benefit to society when really smart people engage with other smart people and try and make things move forward. Um, Public television in this country started originally as public radio. And that public radio, for those of you who've been to Boston, the number one public radio and television production st company, station, nonprofit enterprise in, in the United States is WGBH. And those letters stand for GBH, Great Blue Hill. That was where a uh, a radio tower was erected um, it, in order to broadcast lectures from Boston and Boston area universities to the country. Um, so I think there's an impulse that we have within the academy. I say we because I work at MIT now, but I've also not worked within the university environment um, to share broadcast out. But I also think that we do a disservice if we underestimate how many people actually hunger for good knowledge uh, delivered for free um, um, or at low cost, but because we're talking about free knowledge in these conversations um, on the web, et cetera. And in some sense, um, it's a responsibility of all of us, wherever we are, inside or outside the academy, to um, make sure that as much as of, of that uh, verifiable knowledge is available for free and freely, which is not to say only free of cost, but free for people to use and to do things with that knowledge and to make more knowledge from it. Um, I think I answered one of your 150 questions. <laughs> well, not not my question. I, mean, I agree. There there are a bunch of questions. The, the, the rephrase that I, I presented. Well, Carlos, you have another one, or please. Yeah, there's. Uh, um, I, the, there are uh, several questions, but uh, I'm I'm going to uh, uh, close one around uh, a topic that I've seen in various uh, questions uh, already, and it's uh, it is about the audience. Um, and it's also a question that has uh, uh, multiple phases. Uh, one uh, has a focus on uh, a possible conflict between uh, internationalization and making uh, the divulgation of science uh, more accessible uh, in uh, a country like Brazil, for example. Uh, and another relates to the audience. Mm. When a university thinks uh, about uh, free knowledge, um, what sort of interactions then uh, should be uh, thought of? Uh, there is uh, one uh, uh, specific thought in the questions that says perhaps uh, we should target uh, higher integration uh, with schools, for example. So I think this is uh, plenty already, Peter. I'll, I'll leave you with uh, those uh, uh, two thoughts. Yeah, I like the way you guys pack like 10 questions into each question. Um, so the the uh, the internationalization question, you know, if you look at Wikipedia, for example, Wikipedia does a phenomenal job of having um, at a core of its operation, the English language encyclopedia, but also having um, multiple languages and encouraging people to translate again and again and again um, from one language into another and back again. Um, I think that's an incredible model for like knowledge production, knowledge sharing um, that recognizes the benefit of localization and recognizes the benefit of internationalization. Look, we, um, we're divided, obviously, the United States and Brazil by a miles 
um, dis you know, geographical distance by language, um, a lot of other things. But I would say that there's more that unites us, especially these days, fortunately or unfortunately. I saw that, you know, Brazil has passed 150,000 deaths of Corona virus and we're over 215 close to 220 between us i don't know that's close to 400 million 400,000 people um sorry and you know if we don't share that in common as a challenge for our societies if we don't share some of the denials of science in common um if we don't share um you know certain aspects of uh, forgetting what it means at the very top of society to be a public servant. Um, you know, we don't share anything. And I think we do share those things. So how do you, how do you devote free knowledge to these questions? I think you try to publish as much as you can under free licenses in this, in this web, in this web enabled universe. Um, uh, you can't stop because the regulations won't exist to um, slow down the amount of lies and half-truths and disinformation and misinformation that exist. Uh, and the funding probably won't be there to build robust alternatives to networks that exist right now for that kind of misinformation as part of our, you know, what gets piped into the... Uh, eyeball and eardrum equivalent of our bloodstream. So I think it's incumbent upon people who are in the academy and people who are in society to try and publish as many factual, verifiable things as they possibly can. Let's see. Maybe we have a question more straightforward, but not of 150 questions in only one. Uh, Kelly Avelino observing that we have a similar scenario in the public school system, Sao Paulo and New York, as pointed out by uh, Shigeru, uh, she says, we have a uh, very similar scenario, and uh, also in 2021, it's already decided that we will have uh, hybrid, hybrid teaching, hybrid learning in public schools. So, this question, her question is, in your view, what would be uh, possible or feasible ways to overcome the difficulties of students in public school system, uh, considering what uh, is the tendency, or not only the tendency, but the fact that the studies that have been made are pointing that inequality is increasing. How, uh, what? possibilities uh, you think that we should uh, try to, to, to experiment, to implement in order to avoid the increase of inequality in the public school systems? Um, you know, uh, I've been involved in a number of conversations today about the work that MIT does. Um, and some of that work is, this is a long answer, to your short question. Um, some of that work is um, focused on uh, creating vaccines um, for COVID-19 or um, developing therapeutics for COVID-19. And in some of the conversations today, we were trying to categorize, characterize the work of MIT open learning as the equivalent developing vaccines for disinformation, developing therapeutics for uh, lies, um, developing treatments for um, a world that is maybe more ignorant, um, willfully or not, about certain things than it should be. Um, so if this were considered to take that metaphor, like an information an education pandemic, which is what we face, frankly, in, in, in our worlds today, especially in the United States and Brazil. Um, you know, 
we're going to make available within, I don't know how many months, vaccines for everyone to take. And we're going to start with, you know, health workers and we're going to start with school children. Um, what's the equivalent for what we could do to publicly educate students who are in K through 12, kindergarten through 12th grade education? And I think we just have to figure it out as a society. Do we need to devote more money to this situation? You bet we do. Um, and we can't rely on free material online because in New York especially, um, I'm from New York, I've never been to Sao Paulo, but I know New York pretty well and <clears throat> I grew up there and, and uh, it's a nightmare. Kids can't access the web. Kids in some cases don't have places to go that are warm and um, um, safe apart from school. Um, so we need to figure out ways of providing to children, if this is the main question, um, educational resources and support on a level um, that's completely different to what we provide now, a much greater level, much deeper level as a society. And maybe when we come out of this pandemic, uh, or as we're coming out of it, we'll realize that together. Carol, do you want to? Uh, yes. Uh, Peter, there is uh, also uh, one or more comments about uh, uh, the value of uh, citizens science as uh, uh, a mechanism that universities uh, could have to uh, enhance uh, uh, knowledge uh, in, in society. Would you like to comment on that? Um, yeah, I think it's really important. Um, I think there are, you know, scholars out there, some at MIT, some at Yale, some at Harvard, a lot of other places that talk about distributed knowledge production. And, you know, there are definitely ways for um, uh, knowledge to grow, uh, ways that are led not by, you know, uh, in, intellectuals in, in the academy. Um, but, you know, there are people who train their telescopes on the, on the uh, night sky and they try and map uh, things that they then in turn contribute um, to scientific agencies. Um, there are all kinds of other ways that's, uh, that citizens work um, to basically increase public understanding. And we have to make sure we can facilitate that. Probably one of the things is ensuring that people can remain connected through internet uh, access. But there are a lot of other things too. There needs to be a kind of government on a federal level, on a state level, that signals a willingness to, um, you know, uh, welcome crowdsourced uh, knowledge production, but there also needs to be, um, you know, uh, a little less r reluctance on the part of knowledge institutions to welcome um, contributions from uh, the people who will visit a museum, walk into a library. Um, everybody has got so much to contribute in this world, we should recognize that. Both, both, both you and Shigeru pointed out that globally speaking, we are, we, we observe a movement or a shift with neoconservative political ring, but not only that, I mean a movement to kind of uh, negationism in terms of the science. Uh, Analia Morin yeah, asks, uh, what's your view or <laughs> how can we possibly explain, explain such a wrong public policy related to the pandemic in the country that we have the biggest scientific production? I wish I, wish I knew, but uh, um, I mean, one of the things is 
you know, if you're if you're a child and and you know, you see your parents behaving in a certain way, you might behave the same way. Um, you know, there's this kind of concept of role models, and you know, I, and I think uh, leadership needs to set examples um, about the value of science. Uh, just yesterday, the Republican governor of the state of Massachusetts refused to endorse President Trump for re-election. He's a Republican governor. Uh, and in part, he doesn't do that because Massachusetts is a very science-heavy state. Like, there are a lot of great universities and a lot of great scientific institutions that exist in Massachusetts. It's, uh, you know, we're lucky that way. It's been that way for a long time, 400 years. Um, you know, um, the other thing is television and radio are, and the web are just overrun by people who are sending out messages that science, you know, can be, the science is wrong, uh, as our president put it. But like, you know, so we have Fox News, we have a whole ecosystem of uh, talk radio, it's very big here. I don't know what it's like in Brazil. Um, we have, you know, websites, Infowars. There's a tremendous amount of nonsense, and there's no regulations over that kind of stuff, as there used to be. And, in fact, as those systems were designed to have. But those regulations have been chipped and chiseled away by the very same neoliberal uh financial interests that you mentioned at the beginning of your single question. Um, so I think that we have to reassess once again, as we did here in this country in the 1960s with public broadcasting. Um, if, if we're dealing with what one great public servant, a lawyer once called our vast wasteland, looking at television, and now there's probably other language, slightly muddier, dirtier language that could be used to describe what we have now. You know, back then we developed a whole system of public broadcast, um, much, you know, intentionally we did it. Um, we assembled people, we figured it out. Lyndon Johnson, the president, signed it under into law. And now I think we might need to do something similar with regulations, but it requires us to get a handle on money and how money, um, how, how we need to stop money from buying um, uh, um, politicians. I realize that's hard. I was reading the news today about Brazil. I see that money and politicians go hand in hand or something. Okay. Yeah. Peter, there is um, uh, a question uh, which uh, became also a, a comment that I received uh, uh, just now uh, by email by Norberto Garcia. And uh, it deals with uh, what we discussed in the interview of uh, starting with this uh, book by Edward Wilson, Consilience, and uh, this uh, uh, possibility of uh, linking open knowledge with which with uh, integration of knowledge. And uh, the point by Norberto is that that would uh, require funding agency and governmental agencies to, to, to be prepared to, to deal with those uh, integrated proposals, which uh, uh, somehow uh, is uh, uh, difficult because uh, knowledge is becoming highly disciplinary and coming back uh, to a uh, more transdisciplinary view, it's uh, a complication. Uh, what could you comment on, on this, Peter, please? Um, well, I think Shigeru was very eloquent on the need, for, on the tragedy of, of knowledge being split into different um, disciplines and, you know, um, the disintegrating it from, you know, sciences and humanities and other ways. Um, 
I, I do think I do think we have to um, figure out ways to bring these things together. And you know, if you look at the challenges that are facing the globe today, like the United Nations has the Sustainable Development Goals (SDGs) as we, you know, there's 17 of these, um, and they include things like ending hunger, ending poverty fighting climate um, disintegration and stuff. And all of those challenges require um, multiple uh, approaches, um, multiple disciplinary specializations from a geologist to a lawyer, you know, um, from a, I don't know, um, marine biologist to uh, uh, I don't know, a, a specialist in government policy. Um, e everybody needs to get, so if, you know, if we're serious about tackling these large questions, the only way, um, some, some Russian poet, Joseph Brodsky, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, once said, uh, the only way out is through. And I think that, you know, we have to apply ourselves in all these different disciplines getting out of this mess that we put ourselves in. Um, but, you know, by uniting and figuring out, one of the wonderful things about MIT is that it takes, it takes multiple disciplines and it puts them together under the leadership of a president of the institute or, you know, uh, a team of faculty uh, and staff and, and a, a, a says, okay, focus on this for a while. Uh, help put a man on the moon. Okay, done. You know, but it, it required it required all kinds of disciplines from within and without sciences and engineering to get that get that done. And I think yeah, I think that's the it's a challenge, but it has to be overcome. People have to be drawn to this work from all kinds of different disciplines. I hope that it's a great question and I hope you know, there's somewhat large questions, these questions. And it, it'd be great if there were answers to all of them somewhere that I could read from and, and then recite. But coming up with them myself is not so easy. I think we should. Uh, um, there is one or two questions. Uh, and then, uh, because we're going to. We are getting to the, the end of the seminar. Uh, it's, a, it's a very broad question, this one, but in a way, it's uh, something that we have been thinking about all the, all the way long, this seminar. It's more kind of uh, expressing a, a concern than, in fact, uh, placing a question. But anyway, Igor Ataki, uh, he says he believes that the, the possible way to bridge this gap between uh, science and society, between universities and society, would be uh, to work on a science based or focused on the promotion of empowering citizenship. If we accept this idea, what ways do you see, what actions do you see? You have been talking about some of them in this, in all your questions, it seems to me. Right? Uh, you consider it could be useful, useful to implement in terms of bridging the gap between science and society, considering the, the, the empowerment of citizenships. Yeah, thanks. That is a somewhat broad question. Um, you know, how do you find the intersection? I'll ask. I'll ask him a question. It's him, right? Um, I'll ask him a question, which is how do you how do you how do you find the intersection between doing something that's scientifically 
socially good and doing something for yourself? Where is that intersection lie? And how did you become socialized into understanding that act as one you should take? For example, wearing a seat belt when you get into a car. I don't know. Not everybody does it. Most people do it. Uh, wearing a helmet when you get onto a motorcycle or a bicycle. Not everybody does it, but most people do it. How do they understand that this is a good thing to do? At the base of it is some science, right? Is some, some, um, what? I don't know, uh, physics about, you know, the car stops, the crash happens, you, you know. You move, keep, um, and how did that message get taught to you? I don't know. Uh, you probably can't move around society without a driver's license. Um, and in order to get your driver's license, you have to go to, you know, where are these values? And how do you, how do you plant them in people's minds as good values? Um, uh, as part of, becoming a citizen, a, a good citizen, not a, you know, where, where are those places? That would be my question back to you. And if you can find where, what those points are that we all engage in, we stop, for example, we don't cross the street when there's a red light. Just theoretically, there's some science involved in that, right? You don't want to get bi biologically turned into a, insect on the street. Um, how do you how do you come to know those things? Well, we need to expand those intersections, uh, those coordinates, you know, on a graph so, so that more things happen so that we understand the benefits of vaccines. For example, we have a tremendous number of people in the United States, I think 60% of Americans believe in angels, by the way. Um, but a whole lot of Americans also believe that vaccines, you know, some people think that it causes autism. How do you change that behavior? I think you need, you need a wholesale approach to, um, to, yeah, to understanding what it is to be a member of the society. And we've become completely dislodged by the misinformation that the web and unregulated television and radio have brought brought our way. Peter, thank you. This is going to be the, the last uh, question uh, because uh, we are uh, about to to get to the time that we promise you uh, um, on after the seminar. And uh, it's um, an interesting uh, issue. Um, it's uh, about uh, the, uh, the expression used uh, by the New York Times when they talked about uh, Edward Wilson's book, The New Enlightenment, that we use uh, also in the title of, of our seminar, and that is also uh, in your book. Mm, and uh, so uh, the question would be, uh, why did you advocate for this uh, uh, expression, the new enlightenment? Uh, what uh, do you think is the, 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 the information and the load that, that it carries? Um, so theoretically, I should know the answer to this question because I've written a book on this subject with that name and I think it's going to come up when the book comes out more than once. Um, um, but this is the first time anybody's asked me it in a live environment. So, you know, thank you and thanks, Brazil. Um, I think that um, the Enlightenment gave us um, a lot of things. Uh, yes, it was a lot of white men. Let's face that, right? Off the bat. Uh, somewhere in my book, I call it the Enlightenment. Um, but it was also you know, called the age of reason. And for a reason, um, it began to think of, began to develop concepts of knowledge as divorced from 
church and, and, and state in ways that were super important for the creation of laws and modern society as we, um, as we know it and human and civil rights. And that's the main thing. So the question is like now, can we do something with the web and with the, the new technologies that are at our disposal to maybe um, see that a new age of reason, it comes about. Super hard to be advocating for an age of reason at a time of Trump and Bolsonaro. Sorry, but I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, but we have to do it. Maybe it's even more important to do it in these times. And, and uh, um, the one thing that we have now in the book, you know, I talk about the new, the, the original enlightenment as it was also called the Republic of Letters. You know, it was all these white men writing to each other and publishing stuff in text. And, and I'm trying to argue for a Republic of Images where we can, between YouTube and our camera phones and everything else, like maybe figure out ways of communicating and building knowledge that is image, moving image, recorded sound based knowledge um we're at the beginning of that youtube is still a very young thing and moving images are only 120 years old um so i think i think uh i think we have to self-consciously direct our attention not only to producing more knowledge not only to sharing it more freely and freely in the ways that Richard Stallman and others talk about freedom. Um, Stallman is uh, a great uh, kind of catalyst for the work that I've done. He's a friend in Cambridge. Um, and, uh, but also in new ways, new types of knowledge production. So it's not sufficient to have like a lot of books like 100 years from now when you do a YouTube interview, there'll probably be, you know, screens behind the people who are talking. And, you know, if you look at how people get their news in the United States right now, it's mainly news clips from yesterday that are shown today on the web and on television, video. Um, so I think all those things we have to bring together. Um, like we're bringing them together here on screens and over speakers. Um, it's going to be a new form of knowledge transmission. We need to make sure that we can produce more and more of these things. Uh, although I pity the next victims that you guys bring after me. This is grueling, difficult work that you put me and Shigeru through, but it's enjoyable as well. So thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Peter, uh, thanks uh, a lot for staying with us uh, today. Uh, I invite you to remain in this virtual room for a few minutes after we finish the broadcast. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, everybody. Mm -hmm. Agora vou voltar para para português. Muito obrigado a todos por participar uh, deste debate. E uh, nós temos uh, outros eventos. Uh, uh, por uh, acontecer ainda neste ano, por favor, vejam a programação. Eu agradeço de novo muito a presença de todos vocês. E vou passar a palavra para o professor Manuel, caso ele queira fazer algum comentário final. Muito obrigado. Não, não, não. No comments. Just uh, thank Peter again, in, not only in my name, but the name of all of us guys that work in this commission and the provost of uh, graduate students uh, of the university. Peter, thank you very much. E obrigado a todos pela presença, pela audiência. Até a próxima. Podemos fechar a transmissão.